Muchas gracias, Oscar. Ahora daremos inicio al espacio dedicado a nuestra keynote. Es un verdadero placer invitar a Radia Perman. Ella es ingeniera estadounidense, creadora del algoritmo del árbol de expansión STP, que permitió hace 35 años conectar en red de cientos a millones de computadoras. Su presentación, Thoughts on the Internet, o Pensamientos sobre Internet, abordarán las transformaciones sociales que se han implementado con la llegada de Internet. Welcome, Radia. Okay, so let's see, where are my slides? Ah, there they are. Okay, thank you so much for inviting me. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, the most important point that I'm going to make is that uh, not everything that you read or hear about is actually true. So I want to get people to kind of think critically and hopefully I will kind of get you to look at <clears throat> things in a different way. So um, the way that networking tends to be taught, and this drives me crazy, most books, most courses are um, here, memorize the exact details of the stuff that got deployed as if nothing else ever existed. And, um, You know, it's, it's sort of like saying modern human civilization could not have existed without English. And it could have been built on Italian or German or Chinese or anything. So, um, yeah, if they do mention any of the competing standards that didn't win out, they uh, tend to only say, oh, well, that didn't win out because it was stupid, and the people who invented it are stupid. So this is not really the right way to think about things. Um, you know, the internet is so much more than the, the basic protocols underneath. You could really replace them with similar things, and it would be just fine. So, um, my philosophy on how to teach is that you start with a conceptual problem, like when you plug into a network, you need a unique address. Well, how can you do it? And I'll say, well, here's like seven different ways I can imagine doing it, and by the way, Apple Talk did this, IPv4 does this, IPX did this, and, some, and that's how I teach and that's what's in my books. But um, I've heard that some professors say, why is there stuff in here that my students don't need to know? Um, because when you get, when a recruiter is looking at, um, um, is interviewing you for a job, they don't care if you know Apple Talk. Um, so the professor thinks, well, um, he imagines a student as having this tiny brain that if you tell them anything that is not a question that recruiter will ask, you're, you're wasting sections of the brain. But in fact, if all you care about is IPv4, you will actually have a much deeper understanding of it if you can look at contrasting ways of doing it. Not to mention, if you want to invent something new, it's really important to learn from all the really cool ideas that were in other um, protocols. So, um, you know, where does this confusion come from? Well, hype, you know, people just getting so excited about the one thing or they have a product that does that. Or buzzwords drive me crazy, where it's not exactly clear what it means, like software-defined networking. Um, it, you know, it, it means different things to, to different people. Um, so, Things are so incredibly confusing. When there's two similar things, let's say Ethernet and InfiniBand, I always want to understand what are the true differences between them. And it doesn't seem like anybody else does that. So um, either there are people who are experts in A 
or experts in B. So if you try to ask someone who's an expert in A how it compares with B, they say A is awesome and B sucks. And you ask someone who's an expert in B, you get the opposite answer. But then if um, things come out that there's better things in B, you know, certain features or whatever, no problem. The A people steal the ideas. And um, you know nobody cares what's actually in their spec. They just want to get credit for it. So both A and B are moving targets. It's not even clear what it means to be intrinsically A if you can change everything about it. Um, so standards bodies. I like to tell people that it's natural to think of um, the people on standards bodies as well-educated technologists that are carefully weighing engineering trade-offs, but a much more accurate way to think of them is as drunken sports fans, you know, rah, rah, my team. <laughs> So what about facts? I was once at a meeting where somebody was trying to convince the company that I was at to replace Ethernet with something else that um, he had designed. Now there's nothing good about Ethernet. It's like English. Um, it does the job, and I'm sure you could do a little bit better, but given how pervasive it is, you'd have to be an awful lot better in order to make it commercially viable to replace it. So at any rate, he was doing all of these fancy PowerPoints and Excel things um, to the executives trying to compare against Ethernet. And he was saying all these things about Ethernet that I knew were not true. Um, but there was one thing he said that his got more bandwidth than Ethernet. And my intuition, I couldn't see any reason why his would get more bandwidth. So he said it, he measured it and he got four gig of bandwidth on his, one gig on Ethernet. So I was just too curious. So I said, uh, were you by any chance measuring Ethernet with a one gigabit physical link? And he said, yeah, that's all he could find in the lab. So he was measuring his on a 10 gig link, getting four gig, and Ethernet on a one gig link, getting one gig. But once you put it on a PowerPoint slide, it becomes science and everybody just repeats things. So it's very, very scary to just believe things. Um, so you shouldn't believe something unless you can understand some intrinsic property of it that would make whatever it is uh, they're saying true. So um, yeah, you should encourage and practice critical thinking. So I was once in a group where if you asked a question, the people in the group would say, if you don't know that, you don't belong in this group, which is a horrible answer. So um, if somebody asks me a question that everybody knows, um, like what's a public key, I don't say, how can you not know that? I say, oh, it is the coolest thing, and I can't believe that I have the good fortune to be the first person to introduce you to it. But even more than that is that um, if you get to be senior, you start thinking, oh, I'm supposed to know everything. Now, nobody knows everything. And if you think you know everything, you really got to retire. <laughs> you know, you're kind of dangerous. But um, if you... Um, realize you don't know everything, um, you should be a real role model and you should show you're perfectly comfortable with not knowing everything and also show that it's safe to ask questions and you should be the first person to publicly ask naive questions and that will help everybody around you. Um, it'll help the culture of your group. So how to understand network protocols. There's, n nobody would have designed what we have today. It's just kind of a mess of, um, you know, historical accidents trying to um, incrementally grow from something that we happen to have done before. So if you try to um, just learn it all as if it makes sense, you'll get very confused. The only way to understand it is to look at the history. So, um, um, an example of a question that if you ask um, people who are very familiar with networks, why do we have both Ethernet 
and IP, they'll say because Ethernet is layer two and IP is layer three, and I will explain why that's not true. And um, the answer is actually quite subtle. Oh, I see, I can look over there instead of turning around. <laughs> okay, we're eventually debugging this talk as I do it. So, um, the story of Ethernet. What exactly is Ethernet? How does it work with IP? And what does it mean to be a layer two solution versus a layer uh, three solution? So first we need to review what network layers are. And ISO is credited with um, you know, the naming the layers. Um, and it's just a way of thinking about networks. Nobody exactly implements it uh, this way, but it's a way of learning about networks. So I'm going to talk about my view of the layers, and you'll see in a minute why it's Perlman's view rather than ISO's view. So the bottom layer is the physical layer. It says how to signal a one bit or a zero bit to your neighbor, um, and what the cable looks like and things like that. The next one is the data link layer, which is how to send an entire message to someone who's on the same wire. So layer one lets you signal bits, and somehow you have to say this is the beginning of a packet, this is the end of a packet, and that's what layer two would do. And layer three creates an entire path. It forwards the packet between links. Layer four is like TCP, where the ends number the messages and acknowledge things and retransmit things that get lost. And layers five and above are boring. So that's why it's Perlman's layers. <laughs> Um, so why are we forwarding Ethernet packets? Um, Ethernet was intended just to be layer two, um, a way of speaking to other people who were on the exact same wire. Um, so what exactly is Ethernet since it is forwarded? So there's no way to understand it without looking at the history. So back then, I was the one designing layer three. It was how you plugged a network together and the routers would um, gossip among themselves and figure out how to generate forwarding tables, which would tell them how to move packets. Um, and layer two was just a single link. So what layer, designing layer three meant was, you know, what did the addresses look like, what does the packet format look like, and a routing algorithm, which is the thing that creates the forwarding tables. And that I actually think is much more um, profound um, of a contribution that I've made than, than the spanning tree. But the spanning tree um, has a nice catchy name and also has a great story associated with it. So that's that's somehow what I've gotten to be known for. Um, so how do you get forwarding tables? You could do it with a central node where everybody reports who their neighbors are to some net central node. Um, and ATM and InfiniBand do it that way. Um, or you could do it with a distributed algorithm where everybody computes their own forwarding table. So in a distributed routing algorithm, you have a network like that and the router exchange whatever they know and somehow calculate forwarding tables. So the particular routing protocol that I did, I called link state routing, which means everyone reports the state of their links. So um, here at the top, you see a little network of seven nodes and you see a line between A and B, uh, which means that A and B are neighbors and the link cost is six. Each node generates a link state packet, which is on the bottom. So A says, I am A, I have a neighbor B at a cost of six, and D at a cost of two, and everybody sends their link state packet to everyone else, which gives you complete information about the network, and you could compute forwarding tables. Um, so, <coughs> 
back to history, I was doing layer three and then along came ethernet. So um, the history of ethernet, I'll talk about these, these three things. So originally it was called CSMA CD because there was a bunch of nodes all on the same wire. And if two guys spoke at the same time, their um, transmissions would interfere with each other and people would just get garbage. So um, CSMA CD, um, I, I think I was born with CMSA, uh, CSMA CD. It's kind of a way of being polite in a conference room. So CS means carrier sense, listen before you talk. And if someone else is talking, wait till they're done. Um, MA is multiple access, be aware you're sharing the bandwidth. And CD is collision detect, meaning that um, even while you're talking, you listen in case somebody else started talking at the same time, in which case you stop and start again at a random time later. I'm sort of amused in conference rooms when other people don't do this. So when they feel like talking, they just start talking even if someone else is talking. And for um, collision detect, if they're talking and someone else talks, they start speaking louder. But at any rate, um, that was the original invention of Ethernet, just a way for hundreds of nodes to share a single wire and take take turns talking without anybody, uh, you know, polling them and saying, your turn, your turn. Um, so I looked at Ethernet and I said, whoops, this is a new type of link and my routing protocol would not be efficient with this because my routing protocol required everybody to report every one of their neighbors in their link state packet. So if you had 500 neighbors, like on a um, Ethernet, everyone would have a very long link state packet because they'd have to report all 499 neighbors. So, you know, I did little things to, um, to incorporate Ethernet, like I came up with the notion of pseudo nodes, where instead of having um, on the left, where everybody reports connectivity to everybody, you pretend there's one extra node, which is the Ethernet itself, and everyone just says, I'm attached to that. And then one guy has to say, I am the Ethernet, and here are my 500 neighbors. Um, so Ethernet was a link in a network. It was not a network. I wish they had called it Etherlink instead of Ethernet. Um, so um, there was no forwarding in Ethernet. It was just all one link. So an Ethernet packet, you take the data, you put on a destination address and a source address. It looks just like an IP packet, except the IP packet, the layer three packet, has an extra field called a hop count. And the reason for that is that in case packets, you know, forwarding tables can't um, all synchronously switch to a new topology. So when the topology changes, the forwarding tables may be um, a little out of date with each other and packets may go around in circles. So it's, it's very helpful to get rid of the packets that are just circulating around. Um, so um, the um, Ethernet people, it wasn't like they didn't know about hop counts. It just never occurred to them that anyone would be forwarding an Ethernet packet. So it's easy to con uh, confuse Ethernet with layer three because it looks kind of the same other than the hop count. Um, and it has flat addresses. Why can't we hook the entire um, internet together with Ethernet? It has six byte addresses and IP only has four byte addresses. But one of the geniuses of Ethernet is that it is a flat address space. No matter where you are, you carry around your address. And this is great for auto configuration. People don't have to think about addresses, but it's not really good for conveniently summarizing addresses to keep the routing tables small. Um, so why are we forwarding ethernet packets? So as I said, I was there at, um, you know, at digital, having done layer three for digital. And um, then um, along came the ethernet and people got all excited. Wow, this is the new shiny thing. So we should build our applications talk to talk directly on ethernet. So um, I said, well, wait a minute, no, you still need layer three. And they said, 
um, you know, no, we don't. Ethernet is the new way of doing it. And I said, but you may want to talk from one Ethernet to another. And they said, our customers would never want to do that. So they built their applications without layer three. And their applications were good. They would have been just as good had they done it correctly on top of layer three. So um, at any rate, I was kind of in a bad mood about all of this because you know they were leaving out layer three. I knew that was the wrong thing. So um, then my manager one day said, Radia, we need to design a magic box that will sit between two ethernets and let someone over here talk to someone over there, which is what my entire career had been um, about up to then. But layer three requires the end nodes to add an extra header and, and participate in layer three. So the constraint was, do this, invent a magic box that does not require the end nodes to change, because we've deployed too many of them. And also, there was no spare fields in the ethernet header, and there was a hard size limit. So he asked me to do that and um, on a Friday. And this was, um, he was gonna be gone the whole next week. And this was before people had email or cell phones. So um, uh, he was gonna be reachable, uh, unreachable the whole rest of the week. He also thought it was going to be very difficult for some reason. So um, that night I thought about it and I said, oh, I know just how to do it and I could prove that it worked. Monday and Tuesday, I wrote the spec. Um, in enough detail that the implementers got it working in just a couple of months without asking me a single question. So um, that was Tuesday and I couldn't concentrate on anything else because I had to show off to my manager and he wasn't around. So I spent the remainder of the week working on the poem that goes along with the algorithm. So um, yeah, the basic concept, by the way, I'll get to the poem in a second, is the bridge um, just listens to all packets on all of the ports and stores it up and when the ether is free um, or if it were a token ring when it gets the the token, it forwards onto um, that port. And it can also learn by looking at the source address which port uh, various nodes are so that it may not need to forward the packet if it came from a port where um, this, uh, if it came from a port where the bridge believes the destination is. So um, the idea is you have this physical topology and then the spanning tree turns off some of the links for forwarding. So they're, they're still on for running the spanning tree, but you don't forward data on those links. So this is the poem. Um, so the poem is called the Algorime because every al algorithm should have an Algorime. So I think that I shall never see a graph more lovely than a tree. A tree whose crucial property is loop-free connectivity. A tree which must be sure to span so packets can reach every LAN. First the root must be selected. By ID it is elected. Least cost paths from root are traced. In the tree these paths are placed. A mesh is made by folks like me, then bridges find a spanning tree. <laughs> So I officially spent more time on the poem than I did <laughs> inventing the algorithm and writing the spec. <laughs> so um, then it was sort of cool. Um, um, there was a debate whether we should make the bridge people put in the, um, the spanning tree. As trivial as the algorithm is, it still made it more complicated than simply telling the customers, don't plug things together into loops. And I felt sympathy with them, especially because I believed at the time this was just a quick hack in order to get the world to um, um, be able to give them time to replace the end nodes with ones that have a network stack that have layer three in it. So I didn't think this was going to last very long. So yeah, you know, um, maybe it's not worth doing this until we ver uh, sold the very first bridge. So the story I heard about it afterwards was that we were selling um, the first bridge to the world's most sophisticated networking 
customer so um, at that time. So the um, people were telling the sales guy, oh, we need to talk to the engineers because we're doing all this fancy stuff. And the sales guy said, no, it'll just work. So the world's most um, sophisticated customer had the world's simplest topology, which was two ethernets and one bridge. They plugged it together and it didn't work and they were really angry. And when the people who come to fix things uh, uh, went uh, to their uh, um, customer, they realized the world's most sophisticated customer had done this which is they had plugged both ends of the bridge into the same ethernet. And I was glad I had thought of that case. So it was working perfectly. It was saying, I don't need to forward packets. If I ever do, I'm here. Um, um, but, you know, packets were not magically leaping across uh, through some protocol like ESP. Um, so um, anyway, about a year after the spanning tree bridges were invented, um, CSMA CD died. Um, there is no more CSMA CD in Ethernet. It's only point-to-point -point links with bridges or switches, whatever you want to call them. So um, the next topic is why do we need both IP and Ethernet? So now that Ethernet is no longer a shared link, it's just point-to-point um, -point links, why can't we plug everything together with IP? So, um, um, the world has converged to IP as the single layer three, and it's in all of the network stacks, so why do we need this Ethernet stuff? Um, so if IP had been designed differently, we wouldn't need Ethernet addresses. So, um, yeah. So what's wrong with IP? Um, IP is very configuration intensive, and if you want to move something from one side of an IP router to another, you have to change their IP address. Now, this is not an intrinsic property of layer three. It's just a quirk of IP. So let me show you an example where you could move around and keep your layer ad uh, three address. So um, with IP, every link is a different address block. The router has to know which address block is on which, which port, and if you move to a different side of a router, your address has to change. But layer three doesn't have to work that way. So there was something done by ISO, um, which was called CLNP, Connectionless Network Layer Protocol. And I, when I was in charge of layer three at uh, Digital, I didn't say, Say, wow, I want to invent my own packet format because maybe I'll get a Nobel Prize for doing that. I looked around at what was there and I said, oh, this ISO thing is fine. And it had a 20-byte address. Remember, IPv6 has a 16-byte address. And here we're talking about the early 1980s. This thing had a 20-byte address. Um, but not only was the address bigger, but it also had this very important feature, which is that that um, the top 14 bytes of the 20 byte address was a prefix shared by everybody in a large cloud where you could have hundreds of thousands of nodes in the same cloud. And within the cloud, you could move around and keep your address. So um, with, if you're doing IP plus Ethernet, IP gets you to what IP thinks is a single link, but somehow um, that you want a cloud that you can move around in, and so Ethernet somehow disguises this cloud to look like a single link to IP. So IP gets you to the Ethernet, what it thinks is a single link, but it's actually a whole cloud, and then you have to do this awkward ARP to find out what your address is in the cloud, and then you depend on the cloud for doing whatever. So, um, you know, it might be um, spanning tree Ethernet, which doesn't give you optimal routes, um, or other things, which I'll talk about later. Or if you had CLN the top 14 bytes get you to the cloud, but once you're there, uh, CLNP says, oh, now I need to route based on the bottom six bytes, and um, inside the cloud, the end nodes say, I'm here, I'm here, and the routers route directly to wherever the end node is within the cloud. 
Um, so with hierarchy, if you have one prefix per link, you have to do a lot of configuration. But inside the cloud with CLNP, since everybody shares the same prefix, zero configuration, you just plug it together. And the only configuration you need in the cloud is one guy has to tell the cloud, our 14 byte prefix is this, and, and that's it. So the single worst decision in the history of mankind was that in 1992, people said, hey, IP addresses are too small. Why don't we replace it with CLNP? And um, if we had done it, that was 92. The internet was still just this researchy kind of thing. Somebody showed how to make TCP work on top of this. It only took them about a month. And then all the internet applications automatically worked. So um, it would have been so easy at that point to convert. Um, um, but, um, oh, and also they hadn't invented all these extra things to make IPv4 more tolerable, like DHCP and network address translators. So, um, unfortunately, at the time, the drunken sports fans men mentality came out, and people said, no, the ISO people are idiots. I'm sure we could, we don't even know what CLNP is, but I'm sure we could design some something way better than that. So they, um, they said, we, we don't need to immediately convert. Let's give ourselves time to invent something truly marvelous. And so um, we still haven't really deployed IPv6, you'll notice. And IPv6, unfortunately, is not as good in some very important ways than CLNP would have been. For instance, IPv6 has the same property as IP that every link has its own block of addresses. So if you move around, you have to keep, uh, you have to change your address. So we're still going to need some sort of kludgy um, mechanism that disguises uh, what IP thinks as a link into a cloud that you could move around. Um, so now a slightly different topic. Um, now I'll talk about things that are incredibly obvious, um, but everyone gets them wrong. So version number, like every protocol has a field called version number. In IP, it's, it's right there. Um, now, wh what is a version number? Um, what is the purpose of it? It can't just be decoration. Um, there, there must be some use of it. So um, now a philosophical question is, what's the difference between a new version of a protocol and a different protocol? So in what way would CLNP have, um, by replacing IP with CLNP would have been ripping the heart out of the internet and putting a foreign substance in there, whereas IPv6 is just a gentle upgrade to a new version. Um, and it's not, by the way, but <laughs> In what way can you think of it as a different protocol? Now, it's not reasonable to say, well, it was designed by different people. That, that doesn't make sense. So the only thing that I think makes sense is that um, an envelope in which you carry a packet has a field that says what type of packet is inside. So in Ethernet, there's a field called the Ether type that says whether it's an IP packet or an Apple Talk packet or who knows what else. In IP, there's a field called protocol type, and in TCP or UDP, ports kind of serve the same function. So um, th I claim that if there's two different things that share the same protocol type, and you distinguish which one of them it is based on version number, then they are different versions of the same protocol. Even if everything about them is totally different other than the version number, they're still kind of the same protocol because they share the same protocol type. Whereas if you switch protocol types, if one has uh, protocol type seven and the other one has protocol type 13, they are different protocols even if the specification 
patients are identical other than which version number, uh, which uh, protocol type they're using. So if you differentiate based on the version number, then you can't just say in the spec, write a four in the version number field. You have to also say when you receive a packet, you have to look at the version number, and if it's not the version number that you understand, throw away the packet. Um, so unfortunately, in the IPv4 spec, it just says put a four there. And so they thought they could use the same protocol type for IPv6, but they realized that if you sent an IPv6 packet to an IPv4 node using the same protocol type, it would ignore the version number field and try to parse it as if it was an IPv4 packet. So um, nobody seems to get this right. And by the way, the IPv6 spec, um, I should check again every few years, I should check. But I think it still says, put a six here. And they kind of assume that um, the implementer is supposed to figure out that you're also supposed to look at it. Um, Parameters. You should have as few parameters as possible. I hate technology. I really can't figure out how to use my smartphone and, um, you know, <laughs> I really like a simpler time. So I design technology for me, um, which is that it just works. You don't have to think about it at all. Well, I, I was doing that at digital, and um, some people said, hey, we have customers that really like configuring things. And I said, fine. If they want knobs to play with, I'll give them knobs, but you don't have to touch the knobs. Um, you know, it'll just work. And if you do touch the knobs, maybe you could tune things a little bit better, but um, there won't be any setting of the knobs that can hurt you. So you can't hurt yourself by playing with these. So um, if you have settable parameters, make sure that you can't set them to an illegal value. But sometimes you have um, a value that's legal here and legal there, but they won't interoperate. So let me explain a, um, an example of that. This is something that I was, a concept I was never able to explain to my otherwise bright college age son, which is that there's no such thing as a reliable, I am dead now message. So you have to periodically call your mother. And here's an opportunity for a parameter mismatch, which is how frequently you call your mother versus how long she waits before panicking and calling the police. <laughs> So um, um, what I did when I did my protocol, uh, which unfortunately got named ISIS, by the way. Um, <laughs> um, recently, Trump said that Obama and Hillary had invented ISIS. And so a bunch of my friends noticing that headline forwarded it to me and said, shouldn't you get some credit? <laughs> But at any rate, um, um, OSPF, um, so when ISIS, in my hello message, I go, hi, I'm Radia, I send hellos every 27 seconds. And so my neighbor multiplies that by three and, and decides if he hasn't heard from me for that long, the link is down. Now when OSPF basically kind of copied most of the concepts in, from ISIS and then made it a lot more complicated, I don't know why, um, but when they, um, uh, did that, they noticed the hello timer in there, but what they did with it was that when I say, hi, I send hellos every 27 seconds, they, the spec says you compare that with your own hello timer, and if it's not identical, you refuse to talk. So I've, you know, I've been complaining at them about this for years, saying that's not what you should do. It makes the protocol very fragile. Why shouldn't neighbors have different hello timers? And they said, their, their, their way is simpler and they didn't want to uh, deal with gross um, uh, configuration error. Um, but at any rate. Um, so, latency. If you care about how long it takes to um, get through a network, you want to be able to forward as quickly as possible, meaning you don't want to wait for the entire packet to get there and then make a forwarding decision. You would like to be able to do what's cut through, what's called cut through, which is that as soon as you can make a decision, you start forwarding it even while you're still receiving it. So if you want to do cut through, 
what field is the most important field to look at in order to make a forwarding decision? The destination address. So let's look at the IPv4 header. The absolute last thing in the header is the destination address. You know, if you want to make a quick decision, it should be the first thing. And IPv6 is also the last thing in the header. Um, okay, so now for something completely different. Um, um, what I focused on at the start of my career um, and in the early days of computer networks, um, the foundation was plugging the network together and having it figure out how to move data. So, you know, my contributions were robustness, um, where, um, and, you know, like with a PC, you're used to having it get into a bad state and you just reboot it. Well, you can't reboot the internet. And it turned out um, I didn't do the first routing protocol, um, but um, there was one before that for the ARPANET and I kind of noticed that, hey, if just a few messages get corrupted, the network will never recover, which is really bad for a network because the way you fix it is by sending messages across the network which if it's broken, you know, you really need a reboot or something. So um, my first paper was saying, hey, networks have to be really robust and here's how to design it so that, uh, you know, like it will be self-stabilizing, meaning once bad things stop happening, the network will return uh, by itself. Um, and I worried about scalability, um, and, and those things also, you know, were nice contributions. I happened to be in the right place at the dawn of history, uh, dawn of networking, I should say. Um, so, um, what I didn't worry about because it seemed solvable was knowing who was sending you data. You know, you do that with public keys and all that, and knowing the data has not been corrupted along the way. These all seemed like very simple problems. Um, so the theory sounds great. The source, if I want to talk to my bank across the internet, the source has some DNS name, um, the, the, like bankofamerica.com, let's say. It gets a certificate stating that its public key is associated with that name. And you use a protocol like TLS in order to speak to it, and, and with the magic of cryptography, you can be assured you are speaking to somebody who has as the name bankofamerica.com. Um, so how it works, the user searches for something like mybank.com uh, or, or searches in Google, clicks on a URL that's, that's in the Google thing and URLs are these long, horrible things. Um, so you, um, you send to the DNS name in the URL. I mean, you, you have to first check uh, the DNS name to get an IP address, but yeah, you get this URL, you take the DNS name, you find the DNS name and uh, send it, and the service sends its certificate saying, I own this DNS name. Um, someone that you trust has given me a certificate that says this is my public key and I own this name. Um, and then you do fancy crypto and, and protocols um, so that you know who you're talking to. This all sounds great. But in reality, DNS names don't really mean anything to humans. So I fell for a scam recently. You know, I'm reasonably sophisticated about this. Um, I wanted to renew my driver's license. So I typed into Google, um, uh, renew Washington State driver's license. And um, I knew it could be done online. And so um, here, the top result looked legitimate to me when I was in a hurry and sleepy. This is what I got. Um, and I didn't notice that little thing that said add there. Um, so they pay to be first in the thing. And the, UR, the uh, DNS name looks okay, washingtoninformation.org, that, that seems okay. Uh, but I didn't even really look at it. I clicked on it and it was a well-designed website, you know, that you could click on replace your license, renew your license, get a new license. So I clicked on renew my license, typed in all the information I expected it would ask, like my, like my license number, my address, and my um, um, credit card information. And then it um, said, here's a bunch of offers. 
you are qualified for. At which point I said, whoops, that, that's not right. <laughs> the real site wouldn't have done that. Um, and I read the, the site that I had been at more carefully and it didn't say I would get a license. It said it would give me information to get a license. And one of the offers that it said I was qualified for was a free download of an ebook that would tell me how to get a license. I presume the only thing in there was here's the real site you should have gone to. Um, so, um, yeah, um, I called the bank and I said, help, I know I've just given my credit card number to criminals. And um, they said, well, there's a $3.99 charge that's pending and we can't do anything until it posts, so call us back in a few days. Now, before I got a chance to, the fraud department of my bank called me and said, here's a bunch of transactions, tell us which ones are legitimate. And this site had charged $3.99, but the next day they charged $9.99. The next day they charged $19.99, and who knows how long it would have gone on. So I told my bank these are not legitimate. They changed my credit card number, and they disallowed all of those. So I wasn't hurt, but then I looked, uh, renew Iowa license, renew California license. Every single one of them has things like this. Um, um, so, yeah, the, the scam is lucrative, so there's lots and lots of these places now. So, um, you know, don't blame the user, as somehow we have to make this more secure and all this crypto is not helping us. So WashingtonDriversLicense.org, uh, WashingtonInformation.org, um, yeah, DMV.org, all of those are scams and they're all there. And um, um, Bing as well has them up there. And even if um, um, they didn't allow you to pay to be up in the search order, uh, these, these guys know how to cause their la ranking to go up by creating lots of sites and linking to it and so forth. So new topic, hype. Um, people get taken in by hype. When you hear all the time about something is, is the new internet, you know, blockchain is the new internet, whatever that means. Um, and it's hard to believe when you hear something from so many different places that it could possibly be wrong but it usually is. So um, don't start with a technology like blockchain and say, what can I do with it? Instead, start with what problem am I solving and look at various solutions and compare them. So the example that I'm um, picking on today is blockchain. So people assume that distributed means bad, centralized, no, no, uh, Oh, I got it backwards, sorry. Distributed is good, centralized is bad, and distributed means blockchain. And no, these are not true. So, and it's not even clear what distributed means. Some people think it means that you store your data in multiple places so um, it won't get lost. We always knew how to do that. Um, or that you have multiple servers, so in case one goes down, um, you can still reach the service. Again, this has nothing to do with blockchain. Distributed trust is actually interesting, though. Um, it makes sense not to totally depend on one organization. So an example um, that I like to give of how to do it without this fancy, very expensive, Byzantine quorum consensus kind of thing is U.S. credit rating organizations. So each one of these um, organizations has its own algorithm and its own source of data. So if you look at your credit rating at the various agencies, it'll probably be very similar, but probably not identical. Um, and they don't collaborate with each other in order to come to consensus about your rating. They just work completely independently. And if somebody wants to check your credit rating, they can uh, choose whichever agency they trust or, or uh, look at multiple of them and see if they um, all seem to have about the same answer. Um, so, privacy. 
Um, I don't post on social media. My, my daughter said, hey, mom, you know, you're a computer person. You have to have a Facebook account. So she created a Facebook account for me. She actually created two. One is um, a private one, um, and the other one is a public figure one. And she posts whenever she notices I've gotten some award. Uh, she posts it on there, and I'm sort of mortified that people think I'm saying, hey, look at me. I got, <laughs> and then people, um, you know, send all these friend requests. It's like, I don't even know what that is, you know, whatever. I, I'm never going to post on Facebook, but I do enjoy having an account so I can see what my daughter posts. But anyway, I don't post on social media, so I don't have to worry about my privacy. Um, I'm safe. But recently, uh, um, you know, it doesn't help not to post is what I'm about to say. Um, I made a hotel reservation on the phone, and I did get an email confirmation, and then I looked on a map to see where the um, hotel was, and Google Maps um, helpfully pointed out the hotel and said, your reservation is two weeks from today. <laughs> so they read your email. It's just, you know, kind of terrifying. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah. All right. Um, so the internet knows more about me than I know about myself. <laughs> So truth, is it the end of truth? Uh, it's possible to make fake photographs, fake videos, fake audios that even a human can't distinguish. And I'm, I'm afraid that forensic um, science to detect a fraud, uh, um, a fraud is probably lagging behind the ability to create these things. And so, um, and then the internet can spread it virally. And this is disastrously polarized society, where people just believe what they want to believe, they get um, information from who they want to get it from, and it really is quite terrifying. So user authentication, um, uh, this is another topic. It's common to have to trade off usability versus security. So you would expect to have some sort of graph like this, which is the more usable it is, the less secure, the more secure it is, the less usable it is. But the industry seems to have settled here, which is minimally usable, minimally secure. Um, so every site has different rules for usernames and passwords. You know, it has to be at least N characters, or it can't be any more than K characters, or it has to have special characters, or it can't have anything but letters and numbers. Um, so there was this thing I saw on the internet once I thought was great, but it, I don't know who to attribute it to. Sorry, but your password must contain an uppercase letter, a number, a haiku, a gang sign, a hieroglyph and the blood of a virgin. <laughs> So security questions, who comes up with these? This actually was something that I came across. Father's middle name, nope, my father didn't have a middle name. Second grade teacher's name, I couldn't remember my teacher's name when I was in second grade. Uh, veterinarian's name, I don't have a pet. Um, favorite sports team, what's a sport? <laughs> And my middle name, well luckily I do have a middle name, it's Joy. So I typed J-O-Y and it said, not enough letters. <laughs> So I do not want to hear, we need better user training. Um, or users shouldn't click on suspicious links. What's a link? What's a suspicious link? So um, in my book, um, I wrote this paragraph that I'm about to read that I, I want, I've seen it on quote boards, um, and I think I expressed it exactly right. Um, and so people should take this to heart. Humans are incapable of securely storing high quality cryptographic keys, and they have unacceptable speed and accuracy when performing cryptographic operations. They're also large, expensive to maintain, difficult to manage, and they pollute the environment. It is astonishing that these devices continue to be manufactured and deployed, but they are sufficiently pervasive that we must design our systems around their limitations. So, you know, please do that instead of assuming the user has to, yeah. So, um, parting thoughts. 
um, don't blame the user. Um, and also, like, engineers really should meet users sometime. So I was trying to install an email client, and it asked me, do you want POP or IMAP? I happen to know they're both email standards, but why would I care? And it turns out that it was critically important. I had to pick the one the server was speaking. How am I supposed to know which one the server is speaking? So again, you know, just think about who, you know, don't blame the user. Um, be skeptical about what you read and hear, um, and know what problem you're solving. So this is a real problem in the industry, that somebody hears about a couple of special cases and they start writing code and it doesn't work all the time, so they add more code there. So in my book on layers two and three, uh, called Interconnections, I have these little boxes that I call real world examples to illustrate the point I'm making. So like for scalability, I talk about the wine glass clicking protocol, which works okay if you have four people, but if you have nine people and everyone one has to click everybody else's glass and it gets very unwieldy. So, but this, um, this example is absolutely everybody's favorite and it's, um, it's 100% true and um, it was worth having kids for this one example. Um, and um, it's to illustrate that you should know what problem you're solving before you try to solve it. So when my son was three, he ran up to me crying, holding up his hand saying, my hand, my hand. So I took it and kissed it a few times. What's the matter, honey? Did you hurt it? And he said, no. I got pee on it. <laughs> so, thank you. <laughs> Do we have time for questions? Do we want, um, or of course. Okay. Yeah, okay, you can ask me anything. It doesn't have to be associated with the talk today. Yeah? We have 15 minutes, so it's okay. Okay, and if anyone speaks in Spanish, I forgot to bring my thing to you. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. Yes? Thank you for inviting me, yes. Ah, okay, I definitely could rant about content-centric networking. Um, <laughs> yes, um, but yeah, um, it's sort of like English. You know, what is the next step for English? Are we going to replace it with something else? No, you know, we're going to, it's going to gradually evolve with various things. Um, you know, it would have been better if um, every 20 years we could completely redo design it with something simpler and cleaner, but that's just not gonna happen. And it's not the fault of the underlying protocols. But but the up, upper layer things, you know, I just don't know what to do about, like, like what is truth? Okay, now content-centric networking, um, which also is called information-centric networking or name-based networking. In case you guys haven't heard of it, um, I'm really sorry to pollute your brains <laughs> with this weird concept. So you were happier before this, but um, um, I will explain what it is. I will pretend that I am um, um, a proponent of this. So it's like, oh, the internet is so complicated with DNS names and IP addresses. Um, nobody wants to talk to a DNS name or an IP address. You really want to talk to content. So the, assu uh, the assumption is that there's some sort of global namespace that when when I um, post pictures of my kids, I will have a unique name, and you will know the identical name, so you will search for it, and for privacy reasons, instead of um, the actual string, which is the name, it'll get hashed. 
So you're saying, I am looking for this 128-bit hash of a name, and if your router doesn't have it cached to give it to you, it will basically flood the internet looking for it. Everyone remembers the direction it came from. Now, it's evolved a lot. There, there's, um, you know, I think DARPA, um, maybe, or NSF has been throwing a lot of money at it. So there's a lot of people doing research on it because that's the way to get money. And a lot of them are perfectly reasonable people. Um, and so they're doing reasonable things all under this umbrella. Um, but yeah, there was one person that was, um, I had given an enthusiastic talk about this, about how you don't have to go all the way to the um, one who posted it to get the information. And it's like, we don't do that today. There's web proxies and stuff. So I asked him, what can you do with this that you can't do today? And it was like I was speaking Martian. It was a question that never occurred to him to, to wonder about. And that is a bad way to do research. Don't just sort of launch off into some direction. Instead, again, start with what problem you're solving and the various ways you could do it. So I said, fine, if you can't think of anything you can't do today, what would be better? And he said, well, it's better because it's at layer three. And I said, layers? I'm a human. Don't talk to me about layers. Talk to me about something tangible I can understand, like latency or storage or bandwidth. So um, at any rate, that's sort of my, my rant about it. Um, so uh, as I said, some people are doing things that really are just like what we do it today and they're perfectly reasonable, like they're using URLs and st uh, or, um, instead of just a random string that I choose um, in order to get the research funding. So anyway, okay. <laughs> Good morning, Radio. John Curran. Um, two quick questions. One is uh, just clarifications on your worst decision ever slide. Um, first one is you referenced 92, kind of the uh, post-Kobe IETF rejection of the direction to do uh, ISO CLNP, but you didn't reference 95 when the IETF then did the IP recommendation process and again rejected that time Tuba the second time. Is there is some reason you left out the second time we made the worst mistake ever? Yeah, just curious. Or is one worse than the other? Um, okay, so the audio is sort of bad, so I'm not sure I caught all of that. You're saying there were two times they rejected right. that decision. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well. <laughs> Mistakes repeat, okay. And the only other question is, in your slide, you talked about the benefits that were missed. Like we didn't, you know, we had to create DHCP and NAT. You didn't mention variable length as something we missed out on as a result. And yet, every virtual machine and data center and cloud provider now would kill to have variable length addresses and inherent mobility. And I'm just, it, it, is there a reason that wasn't on the slide? Well, it's just how much can you throw in one thing. Okay. So um, actually, a CLNP had variable length. I said it was 20 bytes, and right. that's not quite true. It could have been, um, you know, smaller. I think 20 was the, the maximum. And some people say, oh, you know, that's why we had to reject this horrible kludge because it would be like so hard to make a forward decision if the thing is variable length, but it actually gives a bunch of flexibility. Um, you know, there was kind of this thinking back when routers were implemented on toasters right. that, um, you know, but there's really no reason why that would have been been hard. So yeah, that, that would have been yet another nice thing about it. It's really sort of, um, if we just think about 92, we would have had bigger addresses yep. um, instead of like, how are we going to get to IPv6 today, the, the amount of um, money that was wasted because of sort of this, no, you know, I'm sure we could do better, uh, you know, not invented here is what it's called, um, is, is very frustrating. Thanks. Excellent talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Perman, for this uh, very interesting presentation. My question is quite different. Don't you think that uh, the internet has become a monster that a human can't control anymore? Oh, I'm sorry, audio is not good, so repeat it. Okay, uh, don't you think that the internet has become a monster that human can't control anymore? Ah, yes. Yeah, the internet is definitely 
terrifying. Um, you know, because of all of these um, scams, all these ways of cheating people, and all these ways of um, confusing people with, you know, with hatred and stuff. If you look at, at a random article on the web about how they've just um, created a new um, color of tulip, and then start reading the comments around, you know, 10 comments down, you're gonna start having, you know, these horrible racial and, you know, whatever complaints. Um, has nothing to do with tulips, but, you know, it. Um, I was thinking hatred motivates people so much. If we can figure out how to harness that as an energy um, source, you know, like it's infinitely renewable, um, we could, you know, solve all of all of the world's problems. But no, it's, it's extremely sad. Um, and yet there's things that work that can't possibly work. I do not understand why Wikipedia works. You know, all of my intuition says that it ought to be just full of nasty comments about Hillary or whatever, um, but um, it's actually the best source in almost all cases of well-written, concise um, um, articles, uh, quite accurate. So um, the fact that anyone can edit these things is just amazing and it kind of works. Um, eBay is another thing. You search for something and you get some merchant you never heard of in a country you never heard of. You send money and, and you get the, the widget that you just ordered. Um, so yeah, there's there's good things about the internet and bad things, but you know, it's, um, I don't know whether it means the end of civilization. You know, people had a good run. I'm sort of curious what will come next. <laughs> So anyway, thank you, Mrs. Persman, for your contributions for for this explanation. Um, any advice for us women in this industry for being as successful as you? Yeah, well, people always ask me, why are there so few women? And I don't know. Um, y you know, like, um, there, there's a lot of things about it, but you can't really generalize. So in some, in a lot of cases, it's really a very vicious place, um, um, especially like standards bodies, because there's kind of no adult supervision. So the way to be powerful in a standards body is to be an incredible bully, and everyone's afraid of you. And then um, the way to, you know, if you're fairly new, you have to kind of follow the bullies around and bat your eyelashes and say, how did you get to be such a genius? And then after, <laughs> after a few years of that, they'll maybe let you have your own ideas. Um, uh, now, but this discourages not just women, but, but a lot of really nice men. And I've also worked with some women that are every bit as relentlessly self-promoting bullies as, as these people can be. So um, these days I'm actually quite passionate about corporate culture. Um, I hinted at that in the beginning about it has to be safe to ask questions. Um, and I believe that if you make it um, good for everybody, that that should help. Now, I sometimes get asked to give talks at, you know, like women things, and, um, you know, so I have a bunch of anecdotes. So I'll, I'll tell one anecdote that was um, a high-tech company uh, sent me a letter, a recruitment letter, saying, we're particularly interested in you as a female thought leader. Now, why did they have to say that? You know, it's like, I'm good enough for a real job. But at any rate, I wasn't interested anyway, but my fantasy reply was, thank you for your interest in me as a, quote, female thought leader, unquote. Although my credentials as a thought leader are impeccable, I must warn you I'm not that qualified as a female. <laughs> <laughs> I can't walk in heels, I have no clothing sense, and I'm not particularly decorative. What aspects of being female are important to this job? <laughs> so, um, you know, and another kind of insight I had once was that I asked some senior women who went from the technical track to the management track, why did you do that? And there were so many reasons they could have given me that I would have been fine with, you know, oh, I love working with people, you know, or they needed someone in that role. Every single one of them told me I wasn't smart enough to stay on the technical track. 
So um, there's this notion of imposter syndrome that um, you know everybody feels, um, and I think people have to kind of say it aloud um, so that you don't feel so alone. When I was in graduate school the first time, I, I dropped out and then finished, uh, got my PhD 10 years later, but my perception at the time was everybody else was in graduate school because they were smart. I had only gotten into graduate school because I studied really hard, and I couldn't imagine doing original research, just some other species did that. So after I did all the courses, I knew how to do that. Um, I had no idea how to start on a thesis, so at that point I uh, kind of dropped out. So I mean, those are all sort of off the top of my head. Um, you'd think that things would change, but I've been in the industry, I don't know, 87 years at this point, and, <laughs> and it's not changing. There's a fair number of junior women, but the more senior you get, the, the fewer there are, and I don't really understand it. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, good presentation. Uh, two uh, questions. First one, when you launch a new book, uh, a third uh, edition of Interconnection, and the second one, the internet was pretty much uh, invented by assuming people you trust each other, like they didn't assume that it would be prefix hijacks IP address hijacks or DNS, uh, people invading DNS of ISPs to put, uh, for example, bank addresses inside the DNS so they can direct the users to another website. The protocol that you mentioned in uh, CNLP, if I'm not mistaken, would come to secure in mind like I assume the internet will not be a secure environment, then we need to make sure that the IP addresses in that, oh, not IP address, the addresses inside that the protocol would be safer for the users to, to use. Uh, okay, so let me start with when will I do a third edition of Interconnections? Well, when I finish the third edition of the Network Security Book, which I've literally been working on for the last um, seven years. I have co-authors on that. Um, my ambition for the security book, uh, it's called Network Security, Private Communication in a Public World. When I do a new edition, I rewrite the whole thing. So my ambition was to take things that are really hard to learn learn about, like quantum computers, what, what are they, um, and what are some of these algorithms to replace RSA, and there is, it, it would have taken me less time if there was anything else that you could read, but there's either pop science of, hey, if we had quantum computers we could fly, or you know, whatever, um, um, or they throw a bunch of math in your face and go, ta-da, um, <laughs> you know, you take these matrices and you do this and that. Um, so. It's taken me a long time to understand them deeply enough that I can explain them at a conceptual level. So hopefully, um, we've gotten to the end of um, you know of of my learning this. Oh, what's really cool is my son is actually one of the experts on post quantum crypto. He works in the NIST group. We've um, recruited him to be a co-author. So uh, people have different skills. You know, I'm I'm good at explaining things once I understand understand it, and he can just read the basic math and doesn't know why that isn't good enough. Um, so uh, yeah, um, but at any rate, um, hopefully, eventually, I will finish that, and then I will try to do a third edition of Interconnections. <laughs> oh, and then this other thing about, suppose we did away with DNS names, because they don't really mean anything. They People think they do, which is actually deceptive, um, and just go with IP addresses. I I don't think that would help either. Um, there was this notion of, oh, PKI is so complicated. PKI is where somebody asserts that this DNS name goes along with this um, public key, and they said, oh, we can make it a whole bunch simpler. Why don't we just um, um, refer to everything by their public key and put that on the ACLs? And no, that doesn't help because I'm not going to remember your public key, so I need some someone that I trust that will securely bind whatever I think of you as with the public key. So, um, yeah, I guess that's the answer. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you, Mrs. Perlman, for such an amazing presentation. My name is Jamilka, I'm Dominican. Um, continue with the topic that the lady said before. As a woman, uh, what uh, challenges have you faced throughout your career? Yeah, well, one thing people ask me is work-life balance. And I have two grown children. Um, now, when I spend 20 minutes with someone that has a two-year-old, I'm exhausted. I mean, th these things, you know, they're constantly looking for ways to kill themselves. They're swallowing everything in sight, um, you know, and the noise and, and whatever. Um, I don't see how anyone copes. On the other hand, I did. I don't remember any time when it was horrible. So I don't have any advice about um, how to do that, because I, I guess I did. Um, uh, yeah, I guess I sort of, you know, one thing I say is don't worry about your furniture. You know, there's going to be jam on it and things like that. Get new furniture when your kids go off to college. But, um, you know, just to kind of show how I don't worry about the little stuff, um, my daughter has always been very proud of me as a nerd. And um, one time in high school, which was, I don't know, 15 or 20 years ago, her teacher teacher said, all women over 40 have gray hair. And um, um, so my daughter said, not my mother. And the teacher said, oh, then she must dye her hair. And my daughter said, dye her hair? She doesn't even comb her hair. <laughs> But um, no, in terms of um, advice, you have to like um, little things. I, and I sometimes observe people in groups and then I take people aside and give them advice. So um, often there's people that never say a word in the meeting because they're waiting until they have the perfect thing to say. And by the time they have that formulated, someone else has said it. So, um, um, you know, what I say is people remember who, who is talking. Now, there's a lot of people that annoy me so much because they just start talking and they figure once I start talking, I will ramble and maybe eventually I'll have a coherent thought. And it's um, like so much trouble to follow what they're trying to say. Uh, but you really have to say something, even if it's, I agree with what George just said. You know, anything like that you should try to speak up. Um, yeah, it, it's just very hard. Um, you know, when speaking up for yourself, so there was one time when I um, was arguing that I, I thought I should be promoted because, you know, all the other people in the group had a higher um, title than me. Now, it's very, um, one weird thing about me is I don't even know what it feels like to get angry or to want to hit somebody. I unfortunately only have two moods, either I'm fine or I cry. <laughs> And so I was just sure that if I went and said, I think I should have a higher title, it just wouldn't, you know, really go over well. Um, but yeah, when you speak up for yourself and then you get what you asked for, it feels tainted. It feels like, well, if I really deserved it, I would just sit there and good things would happen. Um, and then if they happen because you mentioned it, it doesn't feel as good. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, life is messy. Uh, you know, try to help each other, try to make your workplace, um, you know, be a good place. I mean, that's a whole talk, a different talk that I have, which is creating a corporate culture that encourages, um, you know, collaboration and critical thinking and stuff like that. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Radia. Nicolas from Uruguay. I have a, a question that is regarding the, the design process of any new protocol or whatever. Um, I was thinking on IPv4 and IPv6 and the transition and that we were in that transition pretty much since internet has been around. And what's your thoughts on what I may call something like uh, transition-proof design. I mean, is there any room for thinking on on a, a successful transition when you design a new a new protocol, or, or or is it possible that we always kind of tend to break everything and make the transition even 
impossible. Well, okay, so let me start with how do you design things? So um, people have different skills, and that's what's sort of nice about a group, is you, um, an, an ideal group has people with different skills, and you can leverage each other's strengths and so forth. Um, I have this tiny memory. Um, if I have to, like, memorize one more thing, I have to forget something important like my name or something. Um, so what I do when I design something is I get rid of all of the irrelevant details and get to the conceptual heart of the thing. Um, that's also what I do when I give talks. I sort of figure out what it is I really need to talk about, whereas some other people, you know, it's just they're giving you an alphabet soup of all of these standards where what is the point they're, they're trying to make. So, um, yeah, trying to get rid of details that are not relevant and getting to the conceptual heart. Um, in terms of where, I think, you know, the bigger question you were asking is where is there opportunity for research in terms of, um, um, I, I, yeah. And sure, you can make incremental changes to IP and things like that, but, you know, thinking about the bigger problems of really making things usable, um, that might be completely unsolvable, you know, all of this, what is truth. Um, if Facebook had some sort of amazingly fast way of detecting um, when somebody is posting something that's false and refusing to let it be forwarded, the people who want to forward that kind of stuff would just create a clone of Facebook. So, um, yeah, I, I don't, if I had answers, then um, there would be no opportunity for research, I guess, yeah. Oh, an interesting thing coming up is because quantum computers may or may not ever exist, but in case they do, we have to replace RSA with, um, um, with new public key algorithms. And these things have different form factors, uh, you know, maybe bigger keys, may, um, and rethinking your protocols to be um, sort of to fit within the form factor um, of this stuff. Like maybe you don't want to pass keys around in messages anymore. And um, um, so I think that would be kind of an interesting thing to work on. Yeah. Thanks. Good morning. Um, what advice do you give to teachers in their classroom to teach all this technology because all this is going too fast? What we have to do so they can uh, keep researching after they go out of grad school, for example? Right. So um, in terms of teaching, the way that I wish people would teach is don't just take all the details as, uh, um, of the existing things as if they arrived on tablets from the sky in its awesome perfection, but instead try to take little conceptual things, try to get the class to um, figure out, you know, like if you plug into a network, how could you get an address that's unique and uh, try to brainstorm all of the different ways of doing it and then say, oh, okay, and now, by the way, let's look at some existing protocols and how they solve this particular thing. I think that would make a class much more interesting than just throwing RFCs at them and say, memorize these. Yeah. Sorry, just a minute. Uh, this is the last here. Last yeah. question. Okay. Yeah, the last question, please. We are run out, out of time. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Roya. Yeah. So, just want to hear some thoughts about innovation, like the, the comparing the innovation in the internet nowadays compared to, to what it was in the 90s when you were working so hard, and, and where does it take place, or where did it take place at that time compared to nowadays, the, the companies, the researchers, the university, the openness, things like that. I'm sorry, could you re repeat? The innovation, innovation, where new things are being discussed, new things on the internet, how it happened in the past compared to nowadays, the, the role of the standards bodies in the past and nowadays. Yeah, so... Um, the, the, the question underneath is, is it nowadays as open as it was when you were working? 
Right, I, I was, it was a great luxury that I was at Digital and I was the person to design layer three. I didn't need to get it through a committee or anything like that. Um, I did speak to the implementers, I did um, ask other people you know, to brainstorm something with me or I would run designs by them, but it was actually fairly easy. Anything that, you know, got put in, that I put into the spec would get implemented. And you might think, well, DECnet doesn't exist, but actually a lot of the concepts um, have translated. These days, it's just so incredibly hard. So uh, you can do the open source community, where you just kind of get together with a group of people and you implement something, but there's like so many of these things all trying to do the same thing, how to make sure that yours is the one that gets chosen is, is challenging. Um, it, yeah, it's not clear at this point whether the open source community or the standards organizations has more power to change the world. And then of course there's vendors who can just kind of implement their own thing. So I believe in trying to uh, do innovation without, I, I've gotten really discouraged with the standards bodies actually, just the politics of it are, are just, you know, very annoying. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I think it's really kind of cool to do something, but you have to make it compatible with what's out there. So instead of saying, I have a great idea for replacing the internet, um, think of how to make some smarter boxes that don't require everybody else to change. So one thing I did, you know, a, a while ago was called Trill, where um, it was supposed to make spanning tree a lot better, and you could replace any subset of your switches with smarter ones, and the more you replace, the better paths you'd get, the more stable, but you never asked everybody to throw things away. So, um, yeah, the, you can, as I said, beat your head against uh, the, the people in the standards bodies practicing by batting your eyelashes at the bullies. Um, they claim they're trying to change, I don't know. Um, or the open source community, which I've heard is also fairly political. Um, or you can try to work within a company and do innovations. And ideally, after you kind of do proof of concept and it actually works, then it would be kind of nice to open it up to the world um, and let everybody implement it. Um, yeah. Okay, well, I will, I will be around uh, for the whole conference, so people should feel free to chat with me. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Radia. It was a pleasure listening to you.